Uh, this month, I want us to get ready, not just because we are in a holiday mood. So parents and children, we are just planning time out and I have lots of wonderful holiday memories. Relax, refresh. But also because this month, I want us to be spiritually awakened to the fact that God is doing something amazing. Can I say, uh, can I hear amen? God is doing something amazing at an incredible speed. So we are going to start on a new series this month. According to the theme that God gave us as a church, greater. This is a year of greater things, of greater encounters, of greater blessings, of greater promises fulfilled. And out of this, we have this series, one of the many in the year, where we look at how we must be ready to respond when God works in amazing and in a way that we may not be used to. So this series is called Divine Acceleration. Get ready to feel the speed, to feel the wind in your, on your face. Get ready to fly. Today, I want to talk about Divine Timetable. Next Sunday, our guest speaker will be our camp speaker, Pastor Gary Hayes. He came to minister at Faith Assembly about five years ago before COVID. And many of us were infected by his ministry. He has a prophetic anointing. And with that anointing, he has helped many break through into new seasons. So I want you to get ready for what God wants to do in our church and also in your life. And then we're going to celebrate Father's Day. We have Reverend Ian Peters joining us. Uh, he's from um, Australia, and we are so happy that he's passing through town, and he's uh, looking forward to reconnect with us. Some of you may remember him. Finally, we'll end the series with divine multiplication. But before I go into today's sermon, I want to share a testimony, a story. Many of you have prayed for me when I went to the U.S. some two weeks ago. And I want to share this story of how God is not just working in your lives in amazing ways, but throughout the whole world. This picture comprises of mission directors from 74 countries. This is the World Assembly of God family. So we are Assembly of God Church. We are affiliated to the World AG and in this Sanders Summit, uh, sponsored by Minnesota AG, so generous of them, God brought the mission directors, some of the general superintendents together, and then we considered the unfinished task. My friends, there are more than 7 billion people in the world. Many countries have many churches, but we also know there are many countries Many places, many people, groups that do not have a Christian witness, a pastor, a church. And so we know the mission of the church. The heart of AG is always to preach the gospel, to make disciples, and to uh, expand God's kingdom. And so it was a five, uh, four days of considering how we can work together. This picture is the Asia-Pacific. AG Missions Network, of which I'm a part of as well. And we are talking about Indonesia, Cambodia, Vietnam, um, Myanmar, and the Philippines, and Malaysia, and countries in our region. We may not be a strong sending region at the moment, but God is stirring the hearts of the nations, of His church. And we are to arise in this hour, because only together, so we don't just look to the Europeans and the Americans who are strong sending missionary movements in history, but then we arise the uh, people from Africa, from Asia, together, together we will finish the unfinished task. This was the vision and the challenge given to all the leaders in order that when we return to our nations, as the Lord touches the exco of every country, and as the Lord rallies His church together, all right, we are going to get ready for the end time harvest. Let me just drill it down a little bit more. What does it mean for us as a local church? So the next picture shows how we work together. We have been praying for Cambodia. God opened another door for us, another season that we can be a blessing to Cambodia, partnering with Cambodia AG. So Pastor Chai, whom you see standing behind me, it's the missions director from Cambodia. I represent us. And then we have Ken, who is a World AG American missionary. 
And because, take for example, Cambodia has more than 95% Buddhists. And so few churches and so much work to be done. It cannot be done by one person, by one church, by one organization. There is a call. And I want us to hear that call. It's the better call to the church, to you and I, that we come together, we partner together. And then there is speed when there is unity. So this is the amazing uh, story that I'm sharing with you. Uh, right now, even as you speak, Pastor Aggie is in Samrit. We just met her yesterday online. All right, she's doing well. Uh, she, by God's grace, she has been visiting different works, meeting different people. And we are just praying into this new season of our church, sowing into the nations. So I want all of us to get ready because when God moves, He doesn't want to leave anyone behind. Can I hear amen? You are included. You are important. You have a part to play. We don't all have to do the same things, but we all must do something. And so that's the, the challenge to us as a church. Uh, the MC reminds us we are almost midway 2023. Yeah, and greater things happen because we respond. Everybody say, I respond to God. I respond. When there is a response, then there is a, a, a chemistry, a result. So this morning, I want to bring us to the Word of God, and the sharing is on divine timetable. Timing is important. When we were in school, our timetable is very important, especially the exam timetable. I don't know how many of you might have missed a paper because you forgot you've got a paper on that day or you woke up late. Parents, grandparents, right, all help to remind this person you've got an important appointment, be sure to be there. Or for some of us who are looking forward to travel, like next week, some of us are taking a plane to KL. We don't want to miss the flight timing, right? We don't want. One time, I went to an airport early. Wow, this is really classic. I went one day earlier, thinking that I'm flying out that, that the day before my actual departure. And then they said, Miss, your name is not here. How can it be? I bought a ticket. My luggage is all packed. I mean, I'm, I'm gearing up to fly out, you know, the excitement. But it's tomorrow. <gasps> what do I do? So I went home. And my mom said, you're home already? I said, oh, I'm so shy to tell you. I mixed up my days. So it's okay to be early, guys. But we don't want to miss it. So in God's kingdom, it's that awareness. It's that paying attention. What is God saying? What is God doing in this season? Not 10 years ago, not even two months ago, because God is on the move. So the divine timetable, first of all, is to remind us that God works to his own timetable. The Bible is very clear. God has a timetable. It's revealed. When we read the Bible, we understand, and then we pray that we may apply it in our lives. And so today I want to talk about how to trust the speed of God. I don't know if you've ever tried to hurry God. Quick, quick, answer this prayer. Take away this problem. Bring a change. We want, to, we want God to hurry up. We think His timing is too slow. And we don't understand why. Sometimes He tarries. At times, God moves speedily and we are not prepared. We are still putting on our shoes, right? And we're still thinking maybe it's another two years or another two days. But no, now is the time. Now is the day. And so we learn to trust the speed of God. Many times I try to speed up God, it doesn't work. He has a mind of his own, a timing of his own, and he wants us to trust him. So this morning, we are talking about how to trust God's timing. Maybe today you're waiting on God for something. And sometimes we get discouraged, and sometimes we get distracted, and sometimes we, get, uh, we forget, we get confused, we, we, we totally miss it. So three responses to God's timetable. Are you ready? So begin to take down notes. How do we respond to God when He's doing something? Three responses. And we're going to look at the life of the prophet Jonah. And there are three responses. I'll just list them out first. The first is we can be a contender. A second, you're a blender. And the third, you're a follower. The first one, the contender. So... We are going to look at four chapters of Jonah. It's a short book, 
but we are shocked. When we turn to the first chapter, first verse, we see a rebellious prophet. Seldom do you see a prophet, a man of God, rebelling against God. We are talking how even this man of God has problem accepting God's plan and his timing. So a contender is someone who resists God's plans, anti-God's plans. Jonah is a very interesting character in the Old Testament. You will read of him twice in the Bible. The first time, he was prophesying to a very evil king by the name of jo Joho Jehoboam, Jeroboam, one of the evil kings in the Old Testament. And he was telling the king, go, fight the battle, you will win. On the other side of the king is prophet Amos, recorded in the book of Amos, Man of God also prophesied to the evil king, you will fail in this battle. So we have this suspicious about Jonah. Is he someone who can hear from God? Is he someone who will obey God? Is he someone who will do God's assignment? So there is this shadow, you know, about this rebellious prophet. But when you go to Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So immediately, we look at this rebellious prophet who heard from God. I have an assignment. I want you to go and preach to the great city of Nineveh. The timing for Nineveh has come. Nineveh was a great city. It was an evil city. We don't know what kind of evil deeds were. Uh, Jonah did not mention, but it's recorded in world history. It is the enemy, the arch enemy of Israel. And Jonah didn't look forward to this mission. How can I go to my enemy and preach to them? So God's timing is preach to them because I'm going to judge them. God has a timetable for grace. God also has a timetable for judgment. And when we lean in, we begin to see how important these timings are because in a period of grace, when you call upon God, God will stretch out His hand and save us. But when the time has reached, it's appointed time. God decides that when is that appointed time for judgment and destruction. That's the end of the story. So here, the time for Nineveh has come and Jonah wants to go. The wickedness has come before God. And God is going to stretch out His hand to strike them unless they repent. So the first thing we learn from Jonah is he resisted God's plan. He went the opposite direction. Brothers and sisters, have you ever tried running away from God? Have you ever tried turning down His assignment and go do your own thing because you find God's assignment distasteful? It's not what you want. It's not what you like. It's not to your convenience. It's not to your, it's not to your style. Many times, when we talk about God's timetable, He comes to us, He presents Himself in a way that we may miss Him because we have our preconceived ideas about what God should do, should not do, what God should say, should not say. And we may be like Jonah resist God and turn the opposite direction. There are times when God comes and He gives us an assignment. I believe your life is going to be a blessing, it's going to be fruitful because you take on God's assignments. They are in your family, in your marketplace, in the church, in the mission of God. If you do not do God's assignment, you, are not, you won't be ready to meet God. So God gives you opportunities where you can shine for Him. But then, 
sometimes we run away from those because we find them distasteful. Now, the Bible gives us a clue why Jonah ran away. I do not know why you might be running away today or that you're thinking of running away from God. But let's look at Jonah chapter 4. So we go to the last chapter of the book first. And there we have like a, 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 a picture, right, of why Jonah ran away. In Jonah chapter 4, everyone in the city had repented. So his ministry was successful. Okay? But to Jonah, this, referring to everyone in Nineveh repented, seemed very wrong. How can wicked people overnight repented and God forgave them? He became angry and he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is why, this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, and a God who relents from sending calamity. Even though Jonah was running away, he knew God. And many times, my friends, when we are running away from God, we know God. Who is God? God is gracious. We know He's a gracious God, right? He's compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. A God who doesn't want to judge, but He wants to demonstrate mercy. We, we know because the Bible tells us God is like that. So while we resist God, rebel, we disobey Him, at the same time, we know God is like that. So deep in Jonah's heart, he, he was unable to submit to God's plan and assignment, so he ran away. But God stopped him. I want you to know that God will not let you run away from him or his assignment. He's so committed to save Nineveh, he has decided to use Jonah in spite of who he is, and he will stop Jonah from running. So you know the story. So we go to chapter 2, and this is where Jonah happily went on board, only to discover, uh, this is chapter 1, a great storm erupted. And everyone on board knew this is no ordinary storm. All right, the weather forecast was okay until Jonah went onto the ship. And the wind cannot be appeased, right? The, the rain and, and, and it was so violent and everybody was going to die. You can read that in chapter 1. And the captain and the sailors said, Who among us sinned against God? These are pagans. Uh, they didn't know Yahweh, the God of Israel, but they knew this is a divine act. You know how when you run away, you know God is going to run after you. He sends a storm to stop you. It's a divine act. It's a God act. Things crash. Things stop. Things get interrupted. Things don't go smoothly. He is blocking our way to destruction to disobedience. And this is what happened to Jonah. So Jonah said to them, I am the reason why you are in trouble. What is the reason that you are in trouble today? Could it be because of like Jonah's experience? He said to the captain and the, and, and the sailors, I'm the reason, throw me into the sea and everything will go back to normal. Wow, they struggled, right? How can you throw a man overboard? In the end, because they were all going to die, the captain made that decision. They all prayed, God, it's not our fault that we throw him into the sea, right? But, but please take care of this troublemaker. And they threw Jonah overboard. And then the sea came immediately. God acts. And of course, God provided a big fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for th three days and three nights. And we are very clear, this is a picture pointing to Jesus, who for three days, three nights, were in utter darkness before he was resurrected by the power of God. And we're going to go there at a third point. But there is a connection between Jonah and Jesus. But here we see God will never let us run away from Him. How many of you thank God for this grace? Can I see your hand? God will never let the people that now you're praying for, you are reaching out to, never let them go. They might have lost faith. They might have stopped believing in God, but deep in their heart, if they had a true encounter with Christ, 
they knew they know that God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in grace, rel- relenting from judgment. And so it is where God pursues heart after us like the hound of heaven. There is a very beautiful poem entitled The Hound of Heaven. When I first read it, when I was much younger, it struck me. This is a picture of God running hard after those that run away from Him. It has 182 lines, okay? And uh, the English is in King James Version English, right? The long time ago English. But it talks about how this man who is a priest, who has problems in life, who has sicknesses, how he struggled to live for God. And in his struggle, he said, I try to run away from God, but God never let me go. I try to pray, let the darkness cover me. Can you hide in darkness? No way. God will find us no matter what darkness we try to hide in. And this was the experience of um, this poem writer. He said, I try to find, run away from God with the pleasures of life. But even during happy times, he had no peace because he's running away from God. At the end of the poem, that's where he said, God is like a hound of heaven running after me until I surrender to him. What a powerful picture of the Father heart of God. And that's why as a church, we pray, we give, we serve to reach those who do not know God, to reach those who are far away from God. And and that's why in our own personal work, we pray, God, revive us, lest our heart grows cold. We go away from God and, and, and then we think we'll make it. But no, you cannot forget God's calling to be a child of God. Now, nor can you give up God's assignment for your life. He wants us to succeed and He's going to help us and He will hound us down if He has to. So that is the contender. Fight with God, you lose. But when we surrender to God's mercy and grace, we find tremendous blessings and destiny. Amen. The second, and this is still Jonah, the blender. So he woke up his ideas. After three days, three nights in the hotel called the fish, he woke up his idea. He called upon God, chapter 2, right? He called upon God. God saved him. The fish vomited him out, vomited him out on the land. And then he went to Nineveh. A blender is someone right, who blends uh, God's plan with his own plans. Okay, 50-50. I don't run away from God. I take 50% of what God asked me to do. Then I do 50% of my own. Everybody is happy, right? There are no blender Christians. There are only Christians who surrender all. It's either all or nothing. That's what the Word of God tells us and challenges us. So let's look at the blender Jonah. Jonah chapter 3. Thank God for second chance. Huh? Then the Word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Hey, same assignment. Huh? Same assignment second time. Go to the great city, city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Hey, Jonah obeyed. A change, right? He obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. And Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, God's timing, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God moves, He does it with such great conviction and speed that sometimes we who are in God's work, we who are anticipating, we also get a shock. 40 days and overnight, seemingly overnight, the whole city of Nineveh was turned to God. Sometimes when I look at world missions, as a, local, as a pastor of a local community and in the world missions, I said, God, how can the church, how can we, all right, help these people encounter Christ? And one of the things that God will say to, to me and to the church of God is, what you take many years to label, sometimes God may choose in 40 days or whatever time period 
to move his hand mightily and bring such a transformation. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And we see Jonah responded. So we are encouraged. At least this prophet is not a false prophet. Uh. He tried his best to do God's assignment. And it's interesting, his sermon is 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. In Hebrew, this is a five-word sermon, short and sweet. He's not going to beg the people, please come, God's going to send fire and hailstones and destroy your city. No, he, he hopes the Nineveh, Ninevites do not respond to his message. He's still of the mind that you deserve to die. You are a wicked nation. You are my enemy. How can I, how can I see God do something miraculous in your midst? He was a reluctant prophet. A blender is a reluctant server. Insincere. So he, uh, you know what's so he like? Just show, show face lah. Just do a bit, but don't put all, put their heart, put their best in it. Well, God said, so we kind of do it lah. We kind of obey, uh, we kind of go. Uh. I hope that we will challenge these attitudes in our lives and say, no, this is not the attitude to respond to a God who loves us and who is a great God. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The word overthrown here is very powerful. It determines the future of Nineveh. Overthrown in Hebrew can mean utterly destroyed. So it is true. Jonah was telling the people, if in 40 days, God's going to come and destroy the whole city. It's a warning, it's a judgment. Don't play around with God's timing. So Jonah is aware of that and he just proclaimed it as it is, hoping nobody will respond. At the same time, the word overthrown can also mean transformed. Depending on the people's response, Nineveh will be transformed. No more a wicked city, but a, a city that acknowledges Yahweh, the God of Israel. This is a, a sermon that has both a warning, but also a destiny. And, and what happened was, right, the people responded. When we read the scripture, the king said, everyone, we have done wrong. Such conviction came upon them. Even if the preacher was half-hearted preaching and the sermon was just like that, but the power of God, the presence of God, the conviction of God came upon the people and they all said, we've got to wake up our ideas. So from the king to the youngest, including the cows, right, all put on sackcloth as a sign of humility. We are going to repent before God. And then Jonah 3.10 said, when God saw what they did and how they turned away from their evil ways, he relented. And he did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Exactly according to God's character. Anyone who calls upon the name of God will be saved. Hallelujah. And so the city was overturned in the sense of transformed. Not destroyed. And historian Salas is only 150 years later because Nineveh went back to its wicked ways. 150 years later, God destroyed that city. That's amazing how we can never understand the counsel of God nor the timing of God. However, when it comes to us, how will we respond? Not as a contender, not as a blender, not even in anger. So let's see how, how Jonah responded to God's work. He became angry. Have you, have, you ever become, have you ever been angry with God? Because he didn't do it the way you hope. So this is what happened. And he said, I want to die. I don't want to see any of this. Take away my life. It's better for me to die than to live. How can I see Nineveh, right? Turned around. Ever got angry with God when things didn't go our way, when the timing is not God's timing? We are impatient. We are desperate. We are discouraged. We are fearful. We are confused. In those times, all right, sometimes anger can cause us to make more mistakes. Let me just talk a little bit about anger in our lives. Anger towards God or towards the spiritual leaders or, or spiritual influences in your life. And you think, 
wow, God should have done better, okay? And, and three errors angry people make. When you are angry, watch out for this, right? The first one, like Jonah, quit serving God and others. Too hard. Don't understand what God is doing. You don't have to understand what God is doing to serve Him. But you do need to have a heart that wants to serve Him, no matter where, no matter what. And, and so Jonah, because he couldn't understand the ways of God, he quit. I'm going to get out of the city, which he did, right? So he went out of the city, that's in chapter 4. And then he sat there and said, I'm not going to do this ministry anymore. I'm not going to look at all this. I'm not going to serve people, help people, bless people. Enough. That's what angry people do. Second, another mistake that angry people do is they separate themselves from others. They don't want to talk about it, don't want to see, don't want to be reminded, don't want to be part of a team. Leave me alone. I'm angry. And I don't want to continue in this assignment. And that sometimes, right, uh, comes into our attitude where we are in uh, teams working together. Or in our family, you know, we're angry with someone, so we separate ourselves from them. And, and we actually set ourselves up for uh, destruction. And the third one, which um, is so clear in Jonah's life, he became a spectator. I just want to see. I'm not even cheering. Uh, I just want to see or do. I don't want to do anything. I want to see how long you can sustain in this. So he was outside of the city looking, but with that kind of, hmm, what's going to happen? What happens if there's no, no me? There's nothing uh, that, that, that um, what's going to happen to you? That kind of attitude. So this is where God, he, can't, he came and he spoke to Jonah and dealt with the anger in his heart and dealt with his attitude in serving God and in serving others. Let me conclude by saying God's purpose for Nineveh was fulfilled according to his timetable regardless of the instruments that God used. And in the same way, I think about many times we are inadequate, we feel inadequate to serve God. We, we feel it's a high calling to be in leadership, whether at home or in the church or in our marketplace, right? And sometimes we throw tantrums. I'm not going to do it. Let someone else do it. And, and in spite of all this, God is so patient to deal with us, to help us change. And at the same time, he is on track. His purpose is not swayed because we are not in. So God's great mercy, Jonah 4.11, this summarizes God's heart. Should I not have concern? Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? What did God see, my friends? He saw the preciousness of people who will be lost without the message of Jonah. And although Jonah acted up, God right, did what he has set his mind to do, to bless the city of Nineveh. If God had wanted to judge Nineveh, there would never be a Jonah story. But it was God's desire. Forty days more, I give them a chance, and they responded. And so it is with us. God's mercy is in us, but it's also for the people that he is sending us to. Let me close by saying the follower. I want to challenge us as we are quickened, as you have an understanding that God is on the move. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to be lagging behind. I want to be in step, right? So we want to be in step. We, we want to pray that we will have this attitude as a church, that we fully submit to God's plan. That includes His timing. Praying for ourselves that we are sensitive to what God is doing in our lives at this moment, in our family, and responding, all right? Responding with faith and with trust. Trust the speed of God. He's never late, He's never early. Uh, Jesus, Jesus is one who fully submits to God's plan. I want to end with this, pointing us to Jesus, because we're going to take our communion soon. John 6, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. 
this verse tells us the heart of God. You want to pray for yourself? You can pray the same verse like, God, let me do the will of your will. Father's will. Father God's will. Let me have the heart of, of Jesus not to do my own will, not my own plan and my timing, but to submit. So Jesus knew his life, everything about it, is in the hands of God. God determines the seasons and the times that He will uh, go through and He surrenders to it. And this is why earlier I said Jonah is a sign pointing us to Jesus. Jonah was a rebellious and reluctant prophet. But it's contrasted to Jesus who is an obedient and submissive servant of God. And this is who we want to become because we pray, help me to be like Jesus. It means to have a, a heart that is willing, a heart that is open to do the Father's will, to take on God's assignments. Luke 11.30 For just as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. This verse ties us, um, this verse connects Jonah to Jesus. There are a few other verses, but due to time, I just want to explain a little bit on this verse. How the story of Jonah is not just a story in history. It has such a powerful picture of the future that when Jesus the Messiah came more than 2,000 years ago, Jonah was a sign and Jesus was a sign. Jonah was a sign in the sense that when he went to the Ninevites, he represented God of heaven and earth. I come, I have come, and I will tell you 40 days more. So he was a messenger, wasn't he? They look at him, he was a prophet. A prophet declares God's purpose and timing. They all set up. They paid attention. They responded to God's word. Jonah was a sign of judgment to come. And they responded in the story of Jonah. Now, more than thousands of years later, the Son of Man has come. So Luke 11 is where Jesus speaks about Himself. I am the Son of Man. I am assigned to this generation. He was talking to the people at that time, wasn't He? When you look at me, I represent God. God's timing is the kingdom of God has now come. I am assigned. I will point you to God so that you will respond to God. You will repent and you will also pledge your allegiance to God. So Jesus came as God's representative and many, many rejected Jesus, but some accepted Jesus as the Son of Man, Son of God. And so it is, what a contrast. Jonah, he did not weep for Nineveh. His heart was hardened. But Jesus, he wept for the city of Jerusalem. He saw that people needed God. And he wept. Not only did he weep, he also died for the sins of the world. Another contrast we see, Jonah, he went outside of the city hoping to see, right? I told you he was a spectator. I want to see Nineveh destroyed. But that wasn't God's timing. And Jesus went outside the city to die on a cross to bring salvation. And finally, Jesus surrendered his life to God's timing and plan. The hour has not yet come. So when you read John, where Jesus said, I come to do the Father's will, Jesus was very sensitive to God's timing. Not every timing is God's timing. So he will, on three occasions, John 7, 6, 7, 30, 8, 20 says, this is not the time. And he will not do what God doesn't want him to do. However, when the time has come, John chapter 12, John chapter 13, John 17, when the time has come, he moves with purpose and he, he achieved the purpose of God. So I want to end by challenging us this morning. God is doing something in your life. Sometimes it's very quiet. Sometimes it's very stormy. 
Sometimes it's dark. Sometimes it's like wilderness. Sometimes it's like a springtime. I do not know. But God has a timetable. God has a timetable for faith assembly. We are mid-year and we exist, all right, to honour God. We exist to do God's mission. We exist to build families that will honour God. We have a purpose. Our ministry is to build the body of Christ here. You have a part in that. Our ministry is also to our community and to the nations that we are reaching out in missions. God has a timetable. Let us not be sluggish, but let us be in step. We trust the timing of God. We trust the timing of God. Because when we trust God's speed, we will see the greater things happen. One of the things that is important to us as a church that we have been dialoguing, praying, planning is our church building project. About a month ago, we had a meeting. It was a very a fruitful meeting where we had opportunities to hear what does our church building program look like. It was a chance for many members to ask questions and many of the questions are so good. And so we have gone back to deliberate on them, pray some more and make some plans. God has a timing. And I urge you as your pastor to discern the timing. And the way to do God's work. So on the one hand, it is to encourage us, God is never late, not in a hurry when He's doing something in your life. Don't give up. Stay in that place of faith. From another perspective, God is also saying to us as a church, God has a timing to expand this church and we want to be in step. There are challenges, there are giants, there are obstacles. But we are to come to God And then we are to ask Him to give us the grace and the blessings Let's arise as we respond to God's word this morning So good Lord that you have spoken to us this morning Trust, trust God Trust God's timing Whatever situations we are in Fix our eyes on Jesus Because God's timing is perfect God's timing will bless you But God's timing will also bring Him great glory Amen Let's worship together this song And come to the cross And prepare our hearts to receive the communion